Last week, a tragedy struck the United States. A sudden and catastrophically powerful flood caught both authorities and ordinary citizens completely off guard. And this happened in a country that has everything it needs, a system for predicting natural disasters, public alert mechanisms, and the technical capabilities for emergency response. In reality, if we look at the climate situation honestly and objectively, there's little reason for optimism. So far, there's no sign of improvement. On the contrary, the situation is getting worse. Details about the deadly flood in the United States and other events from the past week in this episode. China. Prolonged heavy rains in Sichuan province have caused widespread flooding, mud flows, and landslides. On July 4th, a massive mudslide struck Danba County, releasing over 200,000 cubic meters of rock and earth from the mountains. As a result, residential homes, power lines, and road infrastructure were damaged. Agricultural lands were also affected. Four people who were herding livestock in the mountains at the time of the disaster went missing. More than 1,700 people were forced to evacuate. On July 5th, a landslide occurred on a national highway in Tianquan County, Ya'an Prefecture. Several vehicles were buried under the debris. Three people died, and the fate of two others remains unknown. USA The state of Texas has just endured one of the deadliest natural disasters in its history. On the night of July 4th, powerful downpours hit the central regions, with some areas receiving more than a month's worth of rainfall in just 24 hours, up to 250 millimeters, nearly 10 inches. At times, the rain was falling at a rate of 100 millimeters per hour. Rivers rapidly overflowed their banks, flooding towns and communities within minutes. Kerr County, located in the Guadalupe River Valley, was hit especially hard. The water level there reached the second highest mark ever recorded. Residents said they received no warnings. Since the county lacks a flood alert system, it wasn't the sound of sirens that woke them. It was the roar of the raging elements. A deadly wave about six meters, 20 feet high, swept away everything in its path, destroying homes and roads. An urgent evacuation of residents began. The situation was especially tragic at Mystic, a summer camp for girls located on the riverbank. The floodwaters caught the children off guard as they slept in their cabins. Many became trapped with no way to escape. All communication with the camp was lost, and washed-out roads blocked rescue teams from reaching the site. According to official reports, 27 children died there, and at least five more are still missing. Search and rescue operations in Texas lasted several days and involved hundreds of specialists, Black Hawk military helicopters, and canine units. More than 850 people were rescued from the disaster zone, many of them airlifted to safety. The disaster claimed 119 lives across six counties in the state. The fate of another 170 people remains unknown. Local authorities admitted they did not anticipate a disaster of this scale, which is why no preventive evacuation had been carried out. Russia. On July 4th, a heavy downpour with hail struck Tiumen. Within two hours, streets, homes, parking lots, shops, and shopping centers were flooded. In some places, water reached the windows of the ground floors. Public transport was operating intermittently. After the storm passed, roads became gridlocked with traffic jams rated at 10 out of 10. At the city's weather station, only 7 millimeters, 0.28 inches, of rainfall was recorded, highlighting how these events can be extremely destructive, yet highly localized, sometimes missing official measurement zones. The day before, in the Ishim district, large hailstones up to 4 centimeters, 1.6 inches, in diameter caused damage to houses, cars, and plants. On July 4th, the city of Omsk was hit by a powerful storm with thunder and heavy rain. Wind gusts reached up to 35 meters per second, about 78 miles per hour. The destructive squall uprooted around 200 trees, toppled bus stops, tore off balconies and sections of roofing, and shattered window frames. A flying sheet of metal pierced a moving bus. The storm damaged dozens of cars and buildings and caused major traffic jams. Entire neighborhoods were left without electricity, and gas supply was partially disrupted. Five people were injured during the storm. A woman suffered injuries and went into shock when part of a balcony collapsed right next to her as she was exiting a building. 
Four others were hurt by falling debris, trees and metal fragments torn from roofs. On July 3rd, Khabarovsk was hit by an intense downpour. Nearly a quarter of the monthly average rainfall fell in just 40 minutes. In some areas, visibility dropped to just a few meters due to walls of rain. Streets, yards and parking lots flooded, and cars stalled in the rushing water. Gusty winds reaching 20 meters per second, about 45 miles per hour, knocked down trees, fences and advertising billboards. Thousands of residents were left without power. Conditions were tense further north in Khabarovsk Krai as well. In Nikolaevsk on Amur, 73 millimeters, 2.9 inches of rain, had already fallen since the beginning of July, surpassing the monthly norm of 57 millimeters, 2.2 inches. Not long ago, Zabakalsky Krai was choking on smoke from wildfires that burned nearly 3 million hectares. Now the region has been hit by heavy rains, causing widespread flooding. From June 30th to July 2nd, the area received up to three times its monthly average rainfall. Dry riverbeds and streams quickly transformed into raging torrents, washing away bridges and roads, and causing extensive flooding and damage. The village of Uldurga was cut off from the outside world. A bridge burned down there in the spring, and now floodwaters have submerged the only road. Residents are left without crossings, communication, internet or supplies in stores, and ambulances cannot reach patients. In the settlement of Darasun, water levels reached waist high in some places. The floodwaters eroded the riverbed, making it three times wider than the length of the bridge, which ultimately collapsed. One house ended up on the edge of a cliff due to a landslide. At Darasun station, the tracks of the Trans-Siberian Railway, the country's main rail artery, were washed out, causing a temporary halt to train services. The disaster also reached the regional capital, Chita. Heavy rains flooded the streets, turning roads into quagmires where vehicles got stuck, and power outages affected several districts. Turkey. On July 2nd and 3rd, the mountainous regions of northeastern Turkey were hit by an unprecedented July snowfall. Temperatures dropped sharply with blizzards, strong winds, and near-zero visibility in some areas. Pastures and roads were blanketed in a thick layer of snow. This abnormal event surprised even the local longtime residents. None of them could recall snow falling here in the middle of summer. Indonesia. On July 7th, Indonesia experienced a powerful eruption of Mount Lawatobi Laki Laki. The eruption was accompanied by a deafening roar and a pyroclastic flow. A column of ash rose up to 18 kilometers, over 11 miles above the summit, while a cloud of searing volcanic particles, driven by strong winds, spread as far as 5 kilometers, 3 miles. Several villages on the mountain slopes were plunged into complete darkness for about 15 minutes and were blanketed with a thick layer of ash, sand and gravel. A severe shortage of drinking water in the region became even more critical due to contamination from volcanic fallout. Local residents reported that this eruption was stronger than previous ones and began without warning. Due to the ash cloud, which posed a serious threat to flights over eastern Indonesia, several airports were closed and dozens of flights were cancelled, including some to and from the island of Bali. The alert level for the volcano remains at its highest. Authorities have warned both tourists and locals to stay at least six kilometers away from the crater. Later that same day, the volcano erupted again, sending another ash plume up to 13 kilometers, over eight miles, into the sky. The eruption was once again accompanied by loud rumbling and ground tremors. <laughs> Typhoon Danus. On July 6th, the island of Taiwan was hit by Typhoon Danus. Even as it approached, coastal areas were already experiencing strong winds, heavy rain, flooding and landslides. A mudslide struck a fishing village, sweeping away everything in its path. Cars floated through the streets like boats. Around midnight the same day, the eye of the typhoon made landfall in Chiai County. The first time in 120 years, a tropical cyclone had reached that area. For Taiwan's west coast, where typhoons are extremely rare, Danas became a truly unprecedented and devastating event. The southern part of the island was especially hard hit. In Yunlin County, wind gusts exceeding 217 kilometers per hour, 135 miles per hour, were recorded. 
In the city of Tainan, the storm completely destroyed the famous gates of the Nankun Shen Daichin Temple, a massive structure taller than a four-story building. In Pingtung County, nearly two and a half months' worth of rain fell in just two days. Nearly 700,000 households across Taiwan were left without power. Typhoon Danus claimed the lives of two people and injured more than 500. After weakening to a tropical storm, Danus struck China's Zhejiang province, moved inland, and its impact in the form of heavy rainfall spread nearly 1,500 kilometers from the coast. Australia. A powerful bomb cyclone struck the east coast of Australia on the night of July 2nd, causing chaos in the state of New South Wales. The storm left more than 40,000 homes and businesses without power. It's easy to see why. Greater Sydney and the Illawarra region were hit hard by flooding, with dozens of roads blocked. Fallen trees and power outages brought train services to a halt. Ferry operations were also completely disrupted. The storm brought powerful wind gusts of up to 124 kilometers per hour, 77 miles per hour. At Sydney Airport, only one runway was operational due to the strong winds, and around 150 flights were delayed or cancelled. Due to the threat of shoreline destruction from four-meter waves, dozens of homes in tourist towns were at risk, and residents had to be evacuated. In some coastal areas, waves reached up to 12 meters, greatly accelerating coastal erosion. In some areas, more than 200 millimeters, eight inches, of rainfall was recorded. The sudden rise in river levels led to widespread flooding. Around Lake Burrell, about 200 homes were flooded overnight. Meteorologists note that this cyclone is one of the most destructive in terms of the combination of heavy rain, strong winds, and coastal impact. Bomb cyclones are more common in the Northern Hemisphere, making their occurrence in Australia, especially so close to land, quite rare. People who have survived devastating events, like the catastrophe in Texas or any other natural disaster, naturally hope that it's over and won't happen again. We're used to believing that bad times eventually pass and things get better. But this is not one of those times. What we've witnessed over the past several decades is that the situation is only worsening, and it's worsening catastrophically. Here lies the paradox. There are over eight billion of us, countless smart and educated people, we have a real chance to save the planet and protect lives. There are scientists who understand the causes and propose solutions. Yet, sadly, many simply refuse to see the threat because accepting the truth shatters their plans, hopes, and visions of the future. This applies not only to the general public, but also to many scientists and politicians, those whom we as a society have entrusted to address the growing crisis of natural disasters. Friends, just take a look at the world. We know from movies and books what a zombie apocalypse is, when a virus turns most people into zombies, leaving only a few healthy ones. Well, we're living in such an apocalypse. Even seemingly smart people are spouting nonsense about obvious facts. And all hope lies with those few healthy ones. Judging by the world we live in now, they are still outnumbered by the infected. Yes, right now, some may not see a way out, but that doesn't mean there isn't one. Sometimes it feels like everything is pushing us to give up. But if we are human, if we want to live, if we understand and value life, then why should we surrender? Because of someone's stupidity or short-sightedness? Because of someone's greed or ignorance, should we just give up and turn away? If you have a conscience, how can you live with yourself afterward? Those who haven't caught this zombie virus must not give up. We have to live with integrity and stand firm. If we truly strive together, we can overcome all the crises in our society, even the most terrible one, the climate crisis. Alone, we can't manage it. Together, we can achieve a lot.